The latest Shimano XTR group set and transmission represents the absolute pinnacle of design right now. It's a phenomenal setup with so much tech. But ever since I made the video over on GMBN Tech last year all about it, I've been thinking we needed to do something else just to show how relevant this is. So we teamed up with Shimano to get a brand new XTR group set and spoke to our friends at Mountain Mania Cycles to get hold of a very special retro bike. <laughs> For this retro versus modern video, I've managed to track down a very special bike and it has an almost completely unridden and completely original XTR M900 group set on it. This is a Trek Y33. Firstly, I must say a huge thank you to Jamie Lynn from Mountain Mania Cycles for kindly lending me this bike. The Trek Y33 was released in 1994 and it's got some serious tech on it especially for a bike of its age. Up front the front triangle if you can call it that is made from a monocoque carbon fiber construction in particular it's using Trek's famous OCLV which stands for optimum compaction low void. Now this front triangle is mated to a 6061 aluminium rear end via a single unified pivot. Now the thing with a unified design is it effectively puts the bottom bracket on the back of the bike. So your chain length does not change whatever happens. So it's gonna pedal exceptionally well. But one of the downsides is it has a very accentuated effect on the suspension. The bike I'm using for the modern XCR approach is an Orbea Rayon, which hails from Basque country in Northern Spain. Now this is a full carbon fiber enduro capable bike running on 29 inch wheels rather than the 26 you saw on the Trek. And it's got 150 mil travel out back compared to the 100 mil that you see on the Trek and it's got 160 on the front here. Okay, so let's take a quick look between the original 92 XCR and the modern 2019. First up, you've got a triple chain set up front with a front derailleur. You don't even have those things, Belly, anymore. Two at the most. Out back, you've got eight gears, whereas on that modern one, look at the spread you have there. It's a one by, which means one chain ring up front and a whopping 1051 selection out back. You can climb up a house with these things. And of course, you've got a clutch on there as well, which means the chain can't come off. And it also means it's nice and silent. The brakes though, you reach for those old cantilever brakes and you will be howling because you're not going to stop anywhere in a hurry. Whereas the latest brakes, of course, they're two piston or four pistons and you're going to be able to stop in any conditions. But that is exactly what you expect when you have 27 years separating the two. Yeah, all right, I know what you're thinking, but actually, this is what we used to look like in the 90s when you rode mountain bikes. And the reason for that is because mountain biking was such a new thing that it was drawing in elements from so many other sports, both within cycling and outside of cycling. You had the road influence, check the spandex lycra thing going on. There was stuff from motocross and BMX, hence the, the big goggles style shades here from Oakley and the Troy Lee helmet that represents a bit of an open face look. And of course, skiing and extreme skiing. Now, this is also the reason why mountain biking developed so fast, and it's where we are now, because we were able to take things from motocross, things from motorsports, things from road cycling, things from BMX, and combine them to put together, in my opinion, what is actually the best form of cycling, because it's so versatile. But in the 90s, stuff was developing at such a fast rate. There was new components coming out seemingly every month, new suspension designs, new parts of mountain bikes constantly and each claiming to be the respective best thing. Well, first up, the thing you're probably gonna notice is how hilariously small this bike looks. So this is a 19 inch. Back in the day, I would have been riding a 21, something like that. Um, of course, it's completely different to what I would be riding now. I'd be riding a much bigger bike with much bigger wheels. Now, by all accounts, this is still a very good bike, a very high-end bike, but it's completely different to what we're used to riding. 
The handlebars on here are absolutely tiny. I'm used to, I'm used to running big wide bars and a tiny little stem, which offers you nice agility, but puts you in a good position on a bike. What I'm noticing here is it's very hard to stop the front wheel from tracking around all over the place because it's got such a big long stem, which uh, almost looks a bit like a tiller that you get on a sailing boat, to be honest. But looking down makes me feel very happy indeed because just seeing the XTR, that's the thing that you, you look for as a mountain biker. And those brake levers just look glorious. Three fingers, they may be, but it doesn't matter. It's not about that stuff. I just love, I really do genuinely love this stuff. But XT for most people, including myself, was something you desired so much and you wanted so much on your bikes, but it was so expensive back then in those days. For most of us, a rear mech was enough. The rear mech was the GTI badge that you used to put on your Golf 1.1. The brakes, however, the performance is a little bit different because unlike disc brakes that we have today, these don't really stop you. They kind of just slow you down, which made descending on top of the geometry being bad, something altogether quite a lot worse. With bikes in this era, it's easy to see why outsiders of mountain biking would think that we're almost a bit suicidal, you know, downhill being classed as an extreme sport. The reason for that is the combination of your brakes not really being able to slow you down, but then the geometry and setup of a bike making it quite terrifying. That was good fun, but that's about as far as I dare take the trek. I did promise to Jamie after all that I wouldn't damage his pride and joy. It is after all a bit of a collector's piece, but thankfully he's lent me something else to uh, continue the video with. This is the Foes LTS, an altogether completely different bike from the trek we've just been looking at. This also came out in about 1994, I think it was prototyped in 93, and it's got very different designs. So it's a single pivot out back, it's got a regular head tube, regular seat tube, and a monocoque style front end, or a semi monocoque. So it's essentially two big parts welded together. Note the hole in the middle, it's essentially to create stiffness by pulling the two parts of the tube together. Oh, uh, well, didn't seriously think I was gonna carry on with a new bike of that era without changing appropriately. Um, yeah, laugh it up again, but uh, the ACDC thing, I thought there was a weak kind of link in there somewhere. The frame shares vague similarity, as does a Trek actually, to the uh, Flying V guitar. Um, and I know that the uh, Rock Purist out there will remind me that uh, Angus Young never actually used the Flying V, but hey, it's a weak link and I'm going with it. thing is with this, it's got 150 mil of travel out back and a little 75 mil fork up front, which to be fair, just can't keep up with it. And that actually says everything about mountain biking in this era because it was experimental. Everything was being developed furiously. And in this era, people took to customizing their bikes heavily. People weren't just running full XT or XTR or anything else on their bikes. They were using a combination of different parts. On so here you've got our answer ATAC stem, Hyperlite bars, and more importantly, these purple Cook Brothers cranks. It's still running XTR rings, it's still running XTR chain, still running the rear derailleur and stuff like that. But really, people were doing this because they were trying to find the best new thing to put on their bikes. And as try as all of these brands did, nothing was quite as good as XTR. XTR always always delivered. Everything has changed with frame layout and frame geometry. If we leave the wheel size out of this, just look at the stem difference between them. We're now running much longer bikes with much shorter stems. It's a much more sensible thing to do. You get the longer wheelbase, you get more grip going uphill, you get more stability going downhill, and the bike is much more in control. When you're riding a bike with a long stem, it pitches your weight much further over the bars, and it's a very nervous feeling. However, we did get used to it back in the day. 
It's only when you compare the bikes directly side by side you realize how much better today's bikes are. When it comes to the brakes though, there simply is no comparison. It's like a line has been drawn in the sand. The brakes we have today allow us to have control on any terrain and you've got all the power you need at a touch of a fingertip, whether you're using a two piston design or a four piston design. You can completely tailor them to suit the way you want to ride. Cantilever brakes were great at slowing you down, but you could never really rely on them. When the rims got wet, they didn't really work. Modulation differed depending on pads that you used and the way you set them up. Today's brakes, it's literally night and day. The stuff back in the day that you would maybe go down for a dare, you can go down stuff much, much steeper and have full control. In fact, you can ride stuff today that you just simply wouldn't be able to ride. Now, much like the foes, the Orbea also has six inches of rear wheel travel, but it's also got six up front and the bike is lighter and far more capable. Hook that up with a 12 speed transmission and there's nothing you can't climb up and there's virtually nothing you can't descend. It's well known that I love my retro mountain bike gear. And today's been amazing getting to ride these real early 90s bikes with the original XTR on against this modern day absolute beast of a bike. But really there's no comparison at all. These bikes are in a completely different era. They're almost insignificant compared to what you can do on a modern bike. But it is important to acknowledge the fact that we got to this via this. These bikes are really important. The refinement that brands like Trek did are responsible for this. Fringe brands like Foes Racing were really pushing the envelope with a six inch travel bike way back in 1994. Without this, we certainly wouldn't have what we have now. Now XTR may well be the pinnacle of drivetrain evolution, but what's important to remember is whilst this is the absolute top end stuff you find on the best bikes of the pro racers around the world, it filters down, which is why I cannot wait to see what's coming next from Shimano. If you love this retro versus modern video, please don't forget to comment in the section below and give us a huge thumbs up. And if you wanna see another video on the XTR, the Geek Edition over on my tech channel, click up here for that one. Cheers guys.